Hello there, this is Jude Socrates. Welcome to video number 40 of my video series on multivariable calculus, known as Math 5C at Pasadena City College. So in this video, we are going to wrap up our study of space curves. I decided when I was planning the, um, the sections and the videos for this chapter, that I would combine the third and the fourth sections into one video for a simple reason. Um, in the third section, we're going to talk about uh, reparametrizing a space curve with respect to what's called the arc length function, and then use that to construct uh, what's called the curvature function. Now, by itself, curvature is not very satisfying, but when we use it to construct the oscillating circle, then it becomes more interesting and satisfying. So I will see you in a minute on page 379. All right, here we are. So I hope you remember back in chapter four, when we constructed contour integrals, we can use the contour integral uh, in the most basic way to find the arc length of a curve. Okay, so if you remember, this is the formula. Uh, you take the derivative, r prime, you find its magnitude, and then you integrate it uh, on the domain of our curve. Okay, so in that section though, uh, the domain had to be a closed and bounded interval. Okay, 0 to 1, 2 to 5, whatever. You can't go off to infinity and it can't be open. Okay, so today we are going to build on this idea and we're going to create what's called the arc length function. Okay, now why would we want to do that? Okay, just because we can. No, not exactly. Okay, the main goal of creating the arc length function is to reparametrize uh, the curve so that we get something which you might think of as a standard parametrization. Okay, why is that helpful? Well, when we see a curve, okay, we've already seen that we can parametrize it in lots of ways. Okay, uh, basic uh, idea. Uh, for a line segment, you can go from A to B. Or you can also go from B to A, right? Either way, you get exactly the same line segment, okay? Now, what about a helix, okay? So there's a standard formula for the standard helix. You just have cosine T, sine T, and T. But if you multiply all the parameters by 2, then that's still going to parametrize your helix, okay? With one uh, important difference, though, you're going to be graphing it twice as fast. Okay, that's because uh, the period of sine and cosine is 2 pi. So when you have cosine 2t and sine 2t, you're going to go twice as fast. Okay, so once the curve is plotted, the, the two are just going to look exactly the same. You can't tell them apart. Okay, it's while you're graphing it, right, if you kind of slow it down and watch how it's being traced, then you can notice, oh, wait a minute, this uh, parametrization with the 2t is going faster than the standard parametrization. And it gets even worse if instead of t or 2t, you have t cubed, okay? So you just replace t with t cubed everywhere. You will again get the same helix, but as t increases, oh, it's going to get faster and faster, okay? So you will get the same graph but it's going to be drawn in different ways. Okay, so let's create the arc length function, right? This is the formula for the arc length. Instead of going from A to B though, we will go from A to any number on the domain, okay? So uh, it might look like A to T, okay? But unfortunately that doesn't make any sense because you have DT as our differential. So we make a, a slight adjustment. We're not going to change the t up here. We're going to change the t in the integral, okay? And that's because when you create the, an integral, uh, your variable is just a dummy variable, okay? So it doesn't matter if you're integrating with respect to x, dx, or t and dt, okay? You're going to get the same antiderivative, essentially, okay? We are computing a definite integral, though. Okay, and that's why we don't change the a, we don't change the t, okay? What we change is this t and this dt, okay? So we have magnitude of r prime of u du, we will integrate that from u equals a 
to u equals p. Okay. Now, um, if you, yeah, it's, it's been a couple of semesters since you did uh, basic uh, first semester calculus. Okay. We saw integrals that look like this in part one of the fundamental theorem of calculus. Okay. So just a gentle reminder, when you take the derivative of this function, well, first of all, it is differentiable. Okay. And the derivative of this function happens to be just the integrand evaluated at the upper end point, which is t. Okay, so the derivative of the arc length function s of p is just the magnitude of r prime of p, which we call the velocity, no, not, not the velocity, that's the speed function. All right, so these two diagrams illustrate how the arc length function works. Okay, we fix a starting point p equals a. So that corresponds to a position on the curve, okay? So it's the same starting position in both diagrams, okay? So if t is somewhere, uh, if r of t is somewhere over here, then the arc length function just gives you the length of this portion of the curve, which is in green, okay? If you travel a little further along the curve, maybe now you're over here, okay? So you have changed position. And the arc length function at that point is, once again, the arc length of this portion of the curve, also in green. Okay. So as we can see, the, the longer you travel, also the longer your arc length is going to be. All right. Let's look at how it works for a standard helix. Okay. Fix the starting time at t equals zero. So our a is zero. This is the parametrization for the helix. We found the derivative, negative sine, cosine, and one. So the magnitude of r prime, we've done this before, sine squared plus cosine squared plus one, we get square root of two, okay? So even though there's a radical, it's still constant. So we can easily integrate zero to t, square root of t du, not dt, but du. But again, that's easy to integrate. So we'll get square root of t times, square root of two times u, from 0 to t, we just get square root of 2 times t. All right, so now that we have the arc length function for the helix, we can construct a standard parametrization for the helix uh, with respect to the arc length, okay? So how are we going to do that? So think of this equation as s equals square root of 2 times t. Okay? It's a very simple linear equation. Solve for t. t is s divided by square root of 2. Okay, so let's move on down here. So because t is s over square root of 2, we can plug in that equation into our parametrization. Okay, replace t with s over square root of 2. And now we get a new parametrization for the helix with respect to the arc length. Okay, so we write that as r sub arc. Okay, a little awkward to say, don't worry, we're going to get rid of it very, very quickly, okay? So we plug in g of s for t. So t disappears, we get only the variable s, okay? So that's why the parameter is now s instead of t, okay? So if we plug it in, we just get cosine of s over square root of 2, sine of s over square root of 2, and s over square root of 2. Okay, so uh, again, s is going to be all real numbers because t uh, is all real numbers possible. Okay, so this uh, reparametrization means that after you travel a distance of s along the helix, you are going to be located at the tip of this vector. Okay, so it's different from r of t. t tells you after you have traveled an amount of time equal to t, then your position is at the tip of this vector. Okay, so this is measured in time, this is measured in arc length or distance traveled. Okay, so this is good for us because it takes time literally out of the equation. And it's not very obvious, but uh, hopefully you'll be convinced that it doesn't matter which parametrization you start out with, 
when you parameterize with respect to arc length, you're going to get exactly the same standard parameterization. Okay. Now, why is this useful for what we want to do? Okay. We are going to use this reparameterization to study what's called curvature. Okay. So as the word implies curvature, it tells you how gentle or how tight a curve is turning. Okay. So how can we think of that? Well, we can start with the unit tangent vector. Okay. So let's pretend this is uh, length one. Okay. So if you're moving around the curve, okay, we saw that the unit tangent vector is going to change its direction. Okay. So if you're going along a gentle portion of the curve, the change in the tangent vector is not going to be very great. Okay. So first it was like this and now it's like this. Okay. So the difference is not very great. Okay. But if you turn rather quickly, Okay, you do like this, ooh, for the same distance, over the same distance, your tangent vector changed quite a bit, okay? So that tells us that the curvature along the second curve is going to be greater than along the second, the, the first curve. Okay, so let me show you the picture first before we do the calculus, okay? So here's a gentle portion of the curve the unit tangent vector hardly changes, okay? So that has a low curvature, okay? If you're over here, uh, oh, by the way, we're changing the, um, the, the distance traveled by the same amount every time, okay? So we're traveling by this amount and we're traveling by the same amount over here, okay? So, here, the change in direction of the unit tangent vector is a lot bigger than at the first part, okay? And here, along this section, again, we're going to travel by the same amount. So if you straighten out these three portions of the curve, they should be the same arc length, okay? But even over this short distance, you, uh, yeah, whiplash, you change direction quite a bit, okay? So this tells you that this portion of the curve will have the highest curvature among the three points that we looked at. Okay, so here's the beginning of the calculus. So we want to study the change of the unit tangent vector, okay? But what we're going to do is we're going to use the parameterization R sub arc to create the unit tangent vector. Where does it come from? You get the derivative or r sub arc, and that's our velocity vector. But it, it's our velocity now with respect to arc length, not time. Okay? So the unit tangent vector, which we will not call by t of s, but t1 of s, because it's a different function. Okay? The input is s instead of t. Okay? So it is the velocity vector in terms of s, divided by the magnitude of the velocity vector, okay? And as we saw from the diagram over here, that change is approximately going to tell us how much your unit tangent vector changes over a small arc length delta s. All right, so here's our first definition for the curvature function. We're going to take the derivative with respect to s of the unit tangent vector with respect to s, and we're going to find the length of that vector, okay? Now, uh, as you can imagine, um, to actually implement this formula, we're going to need several steps. We're going to need the arc length function, then we're going to need to reparameterize, and then we're going to create the, the unit tangent vector from there, and then take the length, okay? Several steps involved, okay? Now, it turns out there's going to be a really nice formula that makes use of the computations that we have so far, okay? So we're going to be building towards that formula. Okay, and this is where the magic of calculus really comes in, okay? So I'm going to start by reminding you that when we created the arc length function as this definite integral, we said that the derivative of the arc length function 
It's just the speed, okay? It is the magnitude of the velocity vector. Okay, so now, how are we going to simplify this formula? Okay, so the idea is to use a composition. Okay, we said that S is the arc length function. Okay, so it's this integral. If we replace S with S of t, okay, then uh, t comes in. Okay. So, therefore, what we get when we create this composition is just the plain vanilla unit tangent vector, which is with respect to time. Okay? So, now we can use the chain rule to find the derivative of both sides of this equation. Okay? What is the derivative of the unit tangent vector? Okay? So, it's just t prime of t, same symbol that we've used before when we created the unit normal vector. Okay, so remember, that was also bad. Okay, according to the chain rule, we take the derivative of t1 with respect to s, and then we plug in s of t. Okay, and then we go into the composition, the inner function is s of t, we take the derivative of s of t, and we multiply those two together. Okay, but what did we say the derivative of s of t was? It's the speed, the magnitude of r prime. Okay, so that's wonderful. Now, what we want, okay, remember what we want. We want the magnitude of the derivative with respect to s of t1 of s. Okay, what we have over here is not quite the same. Okay, but let's take the magnitude of both sides anyway, right? That's already a scalar, so it just stays out, okay? And we have the magnitude of t prime, okay? So what we have here is the magnitude of the derivative with respect to s of t1 of s, where we plug in s equals g of t, s of t, rather, okay? So this magnitude, just isolated, we have this in the numerator and this in the denominator, okay? So I'm going to literally pull a bait and switch on you, okay? But you're going to like it for a change. We want the, for the curvature with respect to S, arc length, as the magnitude of the derivative with respect to S of T1 of S, okay? What I'm offering you instead is the magnitude of the derivative with respect to S where I will plug in S of T into T1 of S. Okay? But that's really more convenient because our original parametrization is with respect to t, not with respect to s. Okay? So wouldn't it be nice if we just stayed with t instead of literally going around through s, reparametrize, and then finally plug into this curvature, blah, blah, blah. That's just insanity, don't you think? Okay? So what we have is an alternative formula. Okay, we're going to express the curvature instead with respect to time. And it's again the magnitude of this vector, which is just the magnitude of t prime divided by the, the speed magnitude of r prime. Okay, so if you would recall a few sec, uh, a few pages ago in the last section, I said, uh, take, take note of this equation because we're going to use it later. Later is now here, okay? The magnitude of the cross product is just the magnitude of r prime squared times the product of magnitude of t prime with the magnitude of the binormal vector. But the binormal vector, unit binormal vector, length one, so it's just magnitude of t prime that remains, okay? So this numerator, magnitude of t prime of t, is just the magnitude of the cross product divided by the square, okay? So we have the square down here, but we're dividing by another r prime, okay? So the final denominator is the magnitude of r prime cubed, okay? So this is a much better formula, even though we wanted a different formula, this is a better formula because it stays with t. We already did the cross product earlier, okay? Now, uh, we get the magnitude, which we also got, remember? This is where the unit binormal 
came from. So we already have the magnitude of that vector and divided by the speed of the cube. Okay, so let's build on our example from the last video. This is our uh, position vector. We already found the velocity and we found the speed, radical 194. We have the second derivative, the acceleration. We took the cross product. Okay, so we found the magnitude of that cross product. It's right here already. Okay, so it's 6 square root of 406. Okay, so at this point, we have what we need to find the curvature. Okay, so kappa at 1 is the length of the cross product, which is over here. Let's make a fraction. So we have 6 over 6 radical 406. And we divide by the cube of the speed, which is this one. Okay, so we take this raised to the third power. Okay, so of course, uh, a single 194 will come out, and we are left with a square root 194. Okay, but um, we can make Maple simplify that for us. Yeah. That will be a curvature where, we, where it rationalized the denominator for us. Okay. Any chance this will simplify? Yes, because that each contains a 2. So compute, simplify. Yes, there's a 2 square root of 19691. Uh, we saw that when we uh, did the binormal vector. Okay. So therefore, we can. Remove this, and we can put parentheses here and ask it to simplify it one more time. There you go. Okay. Yeah, I'm not sure why Maple, you know, you kind of have to coax it to simplify it further. Okay. What is that approximately? Ooh, not very big. Okay. So uh, 10 to the minus 2, so we get 0 .4, 0 0.044. That is a very low curvature. Okay, so yeah, the curvature was very small. Let's explore this concept of curvature a little bit deeper. Okay, see, see what it says for a line. Okay, so we know how to parametrize a line. The velocity is just a direction vector, which is a constant. The acceleration is going to be a zero vector because constant just goes away. So the cross product is automatically the zero vector as well. So the curvature is zero because the zero vector has no length, zero length. Okay. So the curvature of a line is zero, which kind of makes sense. If you're moving along a line, you're not turning your steering wheel. You're not curving at all. The curvature is zero. What about a circle? Okay, so this time you're turning all the time. Okay, I've seen insane kids doing donuts on the street. Please don't do that. Your steering wheel is just kind of locked like this and you're spinning around in a circle. Sounds exciting, but please don't ever do that. Okay, life is too short. So how would you parametrize a circle? Okay, A cosine T, A sine T. All right, we've done this before. Chapter four, trig. Okay, what's the derivative? Minus a sine t, a cosine t, acceleration, minus a cosine t, minus a sine t. Okay, so we're going to take the cross product, and because they're vectors on the plane, we'll just uh, finesse it with zeros for the z component. And what are we going to get? 0, 0, 0 on x, 0, 0, 0 on y a squared sine squared minus minus plus a squared cosine squared so that's a squared okay uh what's the speed we have uh the velocity over here so a squared sine squared plus a squared cosine squared that's a squared square root so that is equal to a there it is okay so the cross product is up here, we take its magnitude, which is a squared. The denominator is a cubed, so we get one over a when the dust settles down, okay? So this is an important 
interpretation. The circle of radius A has curvature 1 over A. Okay? It's the reciprocal of the radius. Okay? So what does this mean? The bigger the circle, the smaller the curvature. Okay? If the circle has radius 1, the curvature is also 1. If the circle has radius 2, the curvature is 1 half. If the circle has radius 10, the curvature is 1 tenth, a lot smaller. Okay? What happens is the radius gets bigger and bigger. The curvature gets smaller and smaller. If you have a, a circle of radius 1,000, the curvature is only 0 0.001. Okay? If you are driving on a racetrack and the radius is 1,000 meters, then yeah, you're hardly turning your steering wheel. That one you can do very safely. Okay? <laughs> Let's go back to our helix, right? So we found the first and the second derivatives. We get the cross product. Okay, so what do we get? Zero plus sine uh, minus cosine zero. Yep. Sine squared plus minus minus plus cosine squared one. Okay. So what is the magnitude of the cross product? One plus one. Oh, uh, no. These two together make one plus one. We get square root of two. What is the magnitude of r prime? Ooh, same thing. One for these two. Sine squared cosine squared one plus one. We get radical two. So therefore, the curvature of your standard helix is radical two over radical two cubed. Okay. So that is one half. Okay. So, uh, yeah, we found the curvature for our, um, Example that we saw in a scientific notebook is very small, something like 0 0.04. Okay, and it's probably easy to see that when you're traveling along that random curve, okay, the curvature is going to change. We saw Viviani's curve um, in our, I believe, first video for this chapter, but um, yeah, I, I didn't show much of it in the last video. Okay, so. Let's revisit it. This is the parametrization for Viviani's curve. Here's the first derivative. Here's the second derivative. Okay. So um, we plugged in this point for theta in the second section. Okay. And uh, we get uh, the velocity using the double angle formulas. Okay. We get the uh, speed and we got the cross product, right? So the magnitude of cross product is this, okay? So the curvature is this as your numerator and this cubed as the denominator. Simplify it, it will get 1.2525. Okay, so uh, yeah, do you want to get the cross product in general? No. Okay, but what if we just plugged in another point? Okay, so how about pi over 2, the top of Viviani's curve? Okay, so at that point, uh, if you plug in pi over 2, okay, double angle formulas are not even necessary, just double pi over 2 to get pi. The velocity is 0, negative 1, 0. <coughs> the acceleration is 2, 0, minus 1. So when you take the cross product, <clears throat> you're going to get 1, 0, 0, and uh, 0 plus 2. Okay, so the length of that cross product is 1 plus 4, square root of 5. Okay, and the denominator is the speed. Okay, what is the speed at pi over 2? Oh, the magnitude of that vector is just 1. Okay, so therefore the curvature length of the cross product divided by the cube of the speed is just going to be square root of 5, right? So square root of 5 is different from this number. So of course for Viviani's curve uh, the curvature changes. 
Right, so in 7.4, we are going to use the concept of curvature in order to create what's called the osculating circle. And then we're going to construct three planes which pass through a point on our curve. Okay, so what's the idea here? If you had a real circle, the curvature of that circle is the reciprocal of the radius, okay? We're traveling on a curve in general, okay? A curve is not necessarily a circle, obviously, okay? But if you uh, walk along a helix, spiral staircase, you might think, oh, wait a minute, I'm just on a circle, okay? Now, what did we say was the um, curvature of the helix? I believe it was one half, okay? So if we actually thought that we were moving on a circle, then that circle should have radius, the reciprocal of curvature, which would be two, okay? So yeah, think about it. The top view of a helix is just your unit circle, okay? But a helix is like, uh, you know, the, the, the slinkies. You, you stretch the circle and you turn it into a helix, okay? So it kind of makes sense that if you look at part of the helix, it still looks like a circle, but the radius is no longer one, okay? The radius would be approximately two, okay? So uh, the osculating circle acts pretty much like the tangent curve, uh, I'm sorry, the tangent vector, okay? If you have a curve, we did the velocity, that was our tangent vector, and if we zoom in, to a small portion of the curve, it might look almost straight. So you can think of the tangent vector as the line that best approximates that curve at that point, okay? So the osculating circle is also an approximation. Think of approximating the curve at that point, not with a line, but this time with a circle, okay? So, how can we construct that circle, all right? So we said the radius should be the reciprocal of the curvature, okay? Whenever the curvature is not zero, okay? So that happens, of course, when the numerator is not zero, when r prime cross r double prime is not zero, r prime is not parallel to r double prime, okay? So that's the radius. Well, what about its center? Okay, so we said that when you're on a curve, the normal vector is perpendicular to the tangent vector. Okay, so if you follow the normal vector from that point on the curve by a distance of the radius, that should be the center of your osculating circle. So start at r of alpha, the point on the curve, and then you multiply your normal vector at alpha, unit normal, by the radius, add that vector to the position vector, you're now at the center of your oscillating circle. Woohoo! Okay, and we're going to construct three planes which pass through that one point R of alpha, okay? How? Well, we have these three unit tangent vectors, okay? So we will just use them one at a time to create these three planes, okay? So the plane whose normal vector is B of alpha is called the osculating plane, okay? It will contain the osculating circle. Why? Because we have normal vector, tangent vector here, the circle is on that plane, the normal vector is the unit binormal vector, okay? The plane whose normal vector is the unit tangent vector is called the normal plane, okay? So I've been using this driving analogy, okay? If you are the driver in this little particle, okay, the unit tangent vector comes out of your body, okay? The normal vector, unit normal vector, is towards the curve. Okay? Are you turning this way? The unit normal vector is this way. The binormal vector is your head, okay? So the normal plane is the plane which contains your torso, basically, okay? The 
um, plane whose normal vector is n of alpha, the unit normal vector, the, it's a little bit annoying that it's not the normal plane. Okay, it's what's called the rectifying plane. Okay, so it's the one that contain that is perpendicular to n of alpha. It's going this way. Okay, so it it kind of tells you how you're turning. Okay. All right, so what we're going to do is let's go back to scientific notebook and let's construct the oscillating circle and these planes for our example. Okay, here we are again. We have the curvature from before. In the last video, we did the normal and tangential uh, components of the acceleration. We're not going to need them today. So what we will need are the unit tangent vector the unit binormal vector. This is what we had last time, but I cleaned it up, okay? Because obviously there's a two in there and like, uh, wait a minute, there's a two in the six, so we can reduce it a little further. Similarly, when we found N, we just got the cross product of B and T. And yeah, there's a two there again, but not out here. It's hiding in here, okay? Because there's a two there, there's a two there. So we can take those two out. And check it out, that radical 19691 is the same radical 19691 that we see in the curvature. Okay, so now, uh, what are we going to do? We want the center of the uh, osculating circle. So we need the curvature, which is over here. And we need the position with what is our position. Okay, here you go. This is our R of one. Okay, that should be a one actually. Yeah, one minus five plus four and so on. Okay, so that's our position vector. Let's copy it at the bottom. <clears throat> okay, and we need the curvature. Curvature is over. Uh, where was it? There it is. Yeah, let's copy it from here. Exactly one of you will know what that was about. <laughs> okay, and then uh, what do we need? The normal vector, which is right here. Okay, so we need the curvature times the normal vector. Oh, how convenient the threes and the radical cancel out. Okay. So therefore, um, multiply these two. And let me put a pair of parentheses around here. Okay. So that is going to be Simplify, those cancel out, and let's just scoot that in here. Okay, so we follow that vector from the position, which is over here, okay? So it looks like I need, let's just make GeoGebra. I'm sorry, scientific notebook. Do the addition for us. I need 0, 8, 6. That's the position. Okay. And then we will add this vector. So this is the center. We have found our center. This plus this vector. And what do we get? Hmm, okay. So not a very pleasant vector, but what are you approximately? Yeah, okay, so about 0 0.02, 8.046. Okay, so that's the center of our oscillating circle. Okay, it's nice to know your center. We have centered ourselves, but we want to graph it. Okay, we want to go to GeoGebra and draw this osculating circle, okay? So how are we going to parametrize it? Okay. We are going to use the same idea that we used to draw a circle on the plane, 
Okay, so this is our standard circle centered at the origin, radius A, but we can scoot it over, move the center to x0, y0, and now when we add it to this vector, we can think of this vector is broken up into an i component and a j component, okay? But i and j are just orthogonal unit vectors on the plane, on the xy plane, okay? We're moving on the curve, and we want to create the circle which is over here, okay? Do we have two orthogonal unit vectors on that plane? Yes, we do. We have the unit tangent vector and the unit normal vector. Okay, so all we have to do, really sneaky, replace i with t and replace j with n. Or if you like, vice versa. Okay? At this point, it really doesn't matter how we draw that circle. All we want is that it comes out looking like a circle. Okay, so there we go. We know the center of the circle. Okay, same formula that we had last time. And then we add the radius times cosine theta times the unit tangent vector. Okay, so radius, cosine theta, unit tangent vector. And then we add the radius, sine theta, unit normal vector. Okay, so it's just going to be a little bit messy. Okay, when we go to GeoGebra, I'm just going to use the approximate radius, okay? I'm not going to um, add it exactly. What we are going to use exactly uh, is the center of the circle, okay? So let's go back to GeoGebra and let's complete our diagram. I lied, I just realized that we have the curvature, but we don't have the radius of curvature, okay? So we need rho, of one, which is the reciprocal of this radius of, uh, sorry, of this curvature. So it's going to be quite, ooh, oh, not so big, 22.3, okay? So that's the radius that we're going to need in Chochebra. Okay, so here's our work from last time. Uh, I isolated the unit tangent, unit normal, and unit binormal vectors. So we're going to use these two to make our osculating circle. Okay? So we're going to make a curve um, using that formula that we just saw. I need to move the frame lower a little bit. Okay, so this part is going to be a little bit messy because we're going to need to combine three vectors. Unfortunately, the curve command does not just let you, you know, add the three vectors and then put O theta from zero to two pi. Uh, yeah, you kind of have to manually do it. So the center is at 181 over 9409 and 75645 over 9409 and 56381 over 9409. Okay, so I will just put that as place markers. And I'm going to need theta from 0 to 2 pi. Okay, so from the center, we're going to build the other two vectors, one component at a time. Okay. So, um, for, uh, let's see, we have the radius, 22.35, and we're going to need the unit tangent vector. So, the x component there is negative uh, 0 0.22, and that will have cosine of t. Ooh, it's starting. Hmm. Very interesting. Okay, but there's more. Okay, deep breath. Now we need the sine t. Okay, same radius, 22.35. So yeah, you can use parentheses if you like. Okay, 
but the contribution of the unit normal vector is 0 0.43. Okay, sine of t. Ooh, changing. Okay, so repeat for the other two components. Okay, so it should start getting closer to what we want. Okay, so plus radius 22.35. And yeah, let's, let's do parentheses. Okay, so for uh, cosine, we need 0 0.29 cosine t. Okay, ooh, ooh, check it out. Yeah, so I'm, I'm using this. Okay, the first one was minus 0.22. Now we need 0.29. For n, we need 0.89. Okay, so plus 0 0.89 sine of t. Ooh. Ooh, it moved, it moved. Okay, I hope it works out for the Z. Okay, so now we have 22.35 times. Okay, so for cosine, I need 0 0.93. Cosine of T. And then for sine, I need minus 0 0.17 sine of t. Whoops, my center was wrong. That's why the circle disappeared. I found the mistake. Uh, we found the curvature over here, and I did not take the reciprocal, okay, because that is... Uh, what we need is the radius to multiply to the unit normal vector, okay? So what we need is this to the negative 1, okay? We take the radius, uh, the curvature, we invert it to get the radius, and then we multiply it to the unit normal vector, okay? So that will still give us rational entries. Uh, what are we going to get? Hmm, okay, so that is the correct center. Okay, so I need to adjust those three numbers at the beginning of the vector. Whoops, one more time. We need to add that vector to the position. Okay, so what is our final center? Where are we? Okay, that should be the final center. I'm going to give it a try first. Finally, success. Okay, so there you go. I adjusted the center. And as you can see, well, maybe not quite. Uh, we don't see the curve anymore. Okay, so let us adjust the uh, parameters for our space curve. Okay, where are you? There you go. Yeah, because it's very small. It's only from 0.5 to 1.5. So let's go from how about negative one to positive. Let's try four. Ooh, there it is. Okay. So we're seeing a lot more of the curve. Okay. But notice that near that point, okay, if we zoom in at that point, that's where we were working. Notice how the curve and the circle are almost indistinguishable from each other. Okay, so again, it's a different kind of tangency. Okay, we have a tangent vector that creates something that looks like a tangent line at the point, but this time, because our curve is not straight, it's curving, uh, the osculating circle looks like a better approximation for the curve instead of a tangent line, okay? So let's just find one of the three planes that goes through that point. Let's find the osculating plane, okay? Because we can really see that it contains the osculating circle. All right, so create the osculating plane. The normal vector that we want is the binormal vector, which is over here, but we only need the direction vector, okay? So we only need this portion. Square root, we don't need it, okay? So 
equation u, equation of the binormal, I'm sorry, the, the oscillating plane. Okay, so the normal vector is this, uh, let's start off positive, how about 53x minus 22y plus 19z equals, we need to plug in the point. Okay, so we are at this point, 0, 8, 6. So we need minus 22 times 8 and plus 19 times 6. All right, so what do we get there? That is negative 62, okay? So we will just graph the Cartesian equation of this plane. You don't have to use surface, okay? You don't have to use surface. To graph this plane, you will parametrize using P and N as two vectors. Okay, back to GeoGebra. Okay, GeoGebra was acting up on me. I was entering the Cartesian equation, and for some reason, the z was getting deleted out of the equation. It wasn't appearing at all. So I resorted to just creating a Cartesian surface uh, by brute force, okay? So I just solved for z and use the surface command. And yeah, the, the plane that we get, of course, contains the osculating circle. The algebra was correct. It's just, what was up with GeoGebra? So let's make this a little bit bigger. Uh, how about minus 30 to 30? Let's see. Oh, how do you look like? Ooh. Okay, so there you go. It definitely contains the osculating circle. Let's make the other parameter bigger as well. You get the 30 to 30. Um, yeah, there you go. So yes, it is slowly, ooh, there it is. It is slowly getting bigger and definitely it contains that oscillating circle. Okay, cool. So you know how to find the uh, Cartesian equation of the two other planes. Okay, just use the corresponding normal vector. All right, that winds up our chapter seven. So I hope you enjoyed that video. Until next time, I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Bye.